Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana, Nui Akea. Today, we're looking at labor and liberation, equality on earth, Article 23, the right to work around the world, and it's so exciting to be able to be joined by Joy. Joy, thank you so much for making time today. Thank you so much, Joshua, for inviting me here. Could you share with us why this issue is so important in international human rights law? Um, of course, uh, the right to work is very important because um, for us in the labor movement, it is important that everyone would be able to participate in the society and are empowered to break out of poverty and challenge the intersecting um, challenges of marginalization and oppression. And we think that... Uh, uh, the right to work or jobs and employment is actually one way to do it. It's an enabling way for for everyone, especially for workers, to be able to get out of poverty, to contribute to the economy. And, and this is only possible if such right is protected and if government is, um, uh, how do you say, upholding such rights by creating opportunities for everyone. It's true because everyone exercises the right to work to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and to the protection against unemployment. So it's so crucial when we look at this important right. Can you share some of the highlights maybe of the labor movement to make a huge difference in our world? Uh, I think the labor movement has been working for so long, for centuries, um, uh, in order to make sure that everyone can freely exercise their right to work. Um, and also other rights under the international labor standards, um, uh, especially um, not not just labor, but especially unions. Unions are very um, uh, have been struggling for a very long time in order for us to get the kind of uh, the different rights at work that we currently enjoy right now. It's not only the right to work, but also making sure that the work that we have are decent. So under the ILO um, uh, framework, um, decent work means that we're enjoying not only the right to work, but also we have the uh, we have um, social protection, meaning as what you said, um, being protected <clears throat> from unemployment, but also not just from unemployment, but also from uh, different vulnerabilities that everyone is facing throughout their life cycle. Um, also, the right to freedom of association and collective bargaining. This is an enabling right in order for workers to get um, and negotiate for what is um, due to them and um, what would make their working conditions better. Um, and also, lastly, um, another pillar of decent work is social dialogue. This means um, this mechanism uh, that enables social partners, meaning the government, the employers, and the trade unions to engage in bargaining, to engage in dialogue, not only to solve um, problems at the workplace, but to also improve um, working conditions, not only in the workplace, but also at different policy levels. So for the trade unions, we have always been um, uh, fighting for rights, um, but also, um, if if I may um, uh, share our current um, campaign, one, or one of our current demands in the International Trade Union Confederation, uh, which is a call for a new social contract. And we are actually happy that the um, UN Secretary General Gutierrez um, adopted um, such a uh, a call for a new social contract. But for us in the trade union, um, it consists of our five, um, oh, sorry, six key demands on jobs, rights, social protection, wages, equality, and inclusion. And, and in this current context, where there is an increasing mistrust in many institutions, um, uh, a new social contract is, is very timely and urgent. It's really important. I mean, you're talking about unions and that's that ability of people coming together to make sure that we have a freedom of future and that our daily work that we do is actually rooted in dignity and making sure that everyone then has a voice and knowing that together when we speak with one voice, we're able to organize against in the earlier days, those very large corporations that are impacting. But then now with globalization and all the, the winds of change that are flowing, it allows the people living in that place to be able to stand up for what matters most to them and be able to make sure that their work 
while also providing basic needs and being able to provide income also guarantees dignity for all. Uh, yes, of course, um, uh, the freedom of association, um, collective bargaining, as well as organizing is very important. As I said, it is an enabler um, for workers to be able to get their um, other rights. Um, for, for me, uh, the right to organize and the right to, uh, right to freedom of association and collective bargaining um, is also about building workers' power. Because as, as you have said earlier, uh, uh, huge corporations have been building their power globally and through globalization they were able to spread such power all over the world and how can an ordinary worker counter that and that can only be countered through um uh, collective action one worker cannot challenge one huge company um one worker would uh, would have wouldn't have the bargaining power to negotiate with with a huge corporation and so for us, unionization or the right to freedom of association is one way for workers to come together um, collectively and, and demand also collectively what is true to them. It is true. It's when workers around the world come together, then in a way they can stem that tide of really that race to the bottom that we see too often happening where corporations would threaten or say, if this isn't done, then we would go somewhere else. This is a chance for people in the place that they know as their sacred home to stand up for what they believe in and also be able to make sure to see the positive power that we have together when we unite with one voice. Yes, and, and as you mentioned, race to the bottom is very much common here in my region in Asia and the Pacific, um, because as you said, in um, in the context of globalization, um, most international or multinational corporations or transnational corporations have also um, structured their production networks in such a way that it's also spread all throughout, um, especially across the region. Um, and and such spread in manufacturing and production also drives the race to the bottom. Companies would go for places that wouldn't pay um, decent wages for all. Companies would go to places where um, freedom of association and collective bargaining is suppressed. Um, they would go to countries where investment um, policies are, are, and, and tax policies are um, favorable to them um, and, and working conditions are not favor favorable to workers in order to make or to do their business um, without uh, obstructions and with guarantees for profits. And, and in, in such way, it's, um, it's usually the workers that are, the that are in the receiving end of, um, uh, how to say this, you know, this kind of exploitation um, in, in order for um, corporate greed to thrive and for them to, to profit from, uh, from the backs of the workers. It's really powerful. And when you tell me that, it makes me wonder what first inspired you to care about the issue and what are some of the first campaigns you were involved in? Um, the, the reason why I got involved in the trade union movement is because of my own personal experience as a worker. I was not part of a union before. Um, I was working in a business process outsourcing company in the Philippines and um, in, in the Philippines, the BPO sector is not unionized at all. And um, it's uh, at the time when I was working in the BPO, I was um, I was very new. I don't know my rights as a worker, but I know there is something wrong um, in, in my company. I, I understand that um, uh, our conditions is not the best and it's, it's uh, we're not paid overtime. We are, we were not um, we were given um, unreasonable quotas, and, and for me that's not um, that's not a good working condition to be in. And so I told myself maybe I should know more about my rights. I should know more about labor policies. I should know more how to deal with all these workplace issues because I will be a work um for my whole life i mean for my whole productive life 
Um, and, and that's when I went back again to the university and I studied labor industrial relations. And that's when I got connected to trade unions um, when I was hired by my professor to be his um, research assistant. And one of my our projects actually um, is on green jobs. And at that time, back in 2009, green jobs was just an emerging um, concern um, because of the threats of climate change. It was very new at that time. Nothing much was written about green jobs. And, and at that time, well, the research that we did was very exploratory. You mentioned the green jobs. It reminds me of all the points that are being brought up that we have to balance the economy and ecology, that we have to understand how everything is interconnected. And you also mentioned earlier the International Labor Organization. That entity, of course, is the oldest UN specialized agency program and fund. It preceded even the United Nations as part of the League of Nations. Can you share a bit how the League of Nations functions when you look at what came out of the League of Nations and how the ILO still works. I believe they have a tripartite system that makes sure that the voices of all are included in policymaking. Yes, I think the ILO is different from other United Nations agency in that sense. It operates in um, a tripartite structure. This means that the social partners, uh, the tripartite partners, the government, employers, and the union are co-equal in making decisions. Um, and they work together, um, especially at the international level, in setting standards when it comes to um, labor conditions. So for example, all the 190 conventions, labor conventions that we have now, are a product of this standard setting mechanism um, among labor employers and, uh, and the government. So as I said, in, in this kind of platform, um, uh, the trade unions or the workers have the power as well, um, not just the government and the employers. They have a say, they have a voice in how um, uh, international standards um, and policies as well as norms are, are being decided and shaped. And when you look at the ILO and its rich history, you see it covers so many topics. You have the permanent forum on indigenous issues coming up soon. And so it's definitely ILO Convention 107 and 169, but there's also ones uh, for laborers, for domestic. Could you share some of the other important issues that maybe people don't consider and understand as part of the glowing global labor movement? I think it's, it's uh, good if I'd highlight um, one of the issues that will be tackled in uh, this year's International Labor Conference, which is with a standard or developing a standard setting mechanism for the rights of workers in the digital economy. I mean, uh, as you said, we already have 190 conventions and they talk about various types of workers. And I think um, in that sense, the ILO um, through the uh, tripartite partners are responsive um, to the changing um, nature of work. Um, so as you said, we have conventions for domestic workers. We have conventions about violence and harassment in the place of work, in the world of work. Uh, we have um, conventions about maritime labor, about in indigenous peoples, about child labor as well. But at this time, um, we see the rise of um, the platform economy um, especially um, at the height of the pandemic. And we um, we have observed how workers in the digital or gig economy have been in um, precarious working conditions. They have been controlled by AI technology, by digitalization, and they have basically no control over um, uh, their working conditions. Um, their um, uh, their labor uh, their labor conditions, working conditions are not regulated um, by the government. Um, this is quite new for most um, countries. And so we think that it is important um, for um, plat uh, workers in the platform economy to be protected as well, to make sure that it is well regulated and um, they would be able to enjoy their rights, especially um, the funda fundamental rights at work 
um, uh, including freedom of association and collective bargaining, as well as social protection, uh, which most of the workers in the platform economy are not covered. And your points are really doing a great job to weave in all what's what matters to everybody around the world and also rooted in the well-being of each person in each Ohana or each family. Because when you look at it, you then start bringing up things that Locke was talking about, about a social contract. And as you shared with the UN Summit of the Future coming up with the current Secretary General talking about a new social contract, it then allows us to take hold of maybe two of the big challenges facing us, one with technology and artificial intelligence, but two also with climate. Can you maybe share how artificial intelligence is such a huge issue that we have to look out for? And then we can get in a little bit more about the UN Summit of the Future and its important parts as it's looking at that crucial aspect of a new social contract, understanding the parameters of what we as people and the planet are facing. Um, in terms of the artificial intelligence, one of the things um, or the threats uh, that workers are facing is the possible loss of jobs um, with, the, with the rise of the artificial intelligence. Um, and, and it has been happening right now. Um, there are uh, restaurants that function um, without, um, uh, with less employees, with, with less workers, um, because it has um, taken over by, it has been taken over by digitalization, by artificial intelligence. And, and in a kind of economy, where unemployment is very much an issue. Um, what is the future of workers um, when they are actually replaced by artificial intelligence, by digitalization, and by automation? Um, and you know, you you mentioned about summit of the future, and and we think that the future of work is actually a threat um, when these types of challenges. And you mentioned also earlier um, climate change. I would add that to the challenges that we are facing right now. Such future is so bleak um, if, if these types of challenges are not addressed. It's true. When you talked about AI and its role, and it makes us think of what are some of the solutions of what we could come up with. And I know there's ideas and discussions that we have to really understand because AI is happening so rapidly and exponentially could challenge and impact the workforce. Could you share a bit, maybe some of the ideas? I know there's ways that we need to counter it today, but then there's also the ideas of universal basic income and other ways to make sure that human rights needs and aspirations are able to be accomplished. Um, we think that um, regulating digitalization is very important in ensuring that um, at the center of digitalization, the rights of the workers are still there. Um, uh, AI probably may not be um, so big right now, um, especially um, in, in this part of the world, in Asia Pacific. But um, digitalization, we have seen that happening already, and we have seen its impacts among the workers. It has um, increased informality. It has increased precarity among workers in the sector. And, and we think that um, because they are not protected by the um, fundamental rights at work, um, their rights are not protected. Uh, they basically are not eligible to um, social protection. As you said, universal basic income, that's not even a thing in, in this part of the world. We have such weak social protection systems to begin with. And you add these challenges um, to the current situation, and, and that's make, that makes it more um, challenging for workers. Uh, that makes the struggle more um, difficult for, for trade unions in this part of the world because that only um, uh, increases, as I said, precarity, that increases informalization, that actually erodes the rights of workers to come together and form a union to be able to bargain for their rights. And at, at, at the very least, it has to be regulated to make sure that what has been won in the past all these rights that we have won in the past should be preserved, upheld, and respected. That is truly so powerful because we've used all of our other human rights, the civil and political rights, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom to assemble and organize and to make an impact on the political scene, but they're all for our economic, social, and cultural. And you weave them together because we know without one, 
the others will not be as important and strong. So it's that bundle of what's beautiful and the well-being for all that we're striving for. Could you share a bit about the importance of climate change and how labor unions are an important force as we go forward to balance economy and ecology? Climate change is one of the threats, as I said, um, one of the challenges that workers are facing right now. We cannot deny the impacts of climate change in our lives. I live in a country that has been hit by many typhoons, by super typhoons um, every year. And I have seen the destruction um, that um, it could um, it could cause um, in the lives and jobs and livelihoods of workers. Um, but at the same time, we also see the importance of transitioning to environmentally sustainable economies and society. And such transition um, will most likely impact workers in the sense that um, jobs will be affected during this process. Um, that's why one of the contributions of the trade union movement um, in the climate change discourse is the, is the concept of the just transition. Um, the just transition did not you know, emerge um, uh, recently in, in climate discussions. It has been there for a long time, um, especially um, from the trade union movement in the U.S. and Canada, when they are trying to balance, you know, environmental and uh, labor challenges. Uh, and for us, the concept of just transition is such a way um, to, bal to make that balance. Um, we think it is important because um, in, in energy transitions, for example, um, there might be workers, for example, in mining, in, in um, power plants that could be affected when um, they transition to renewable energy. Uh, but um, we want those workers to be protected through social protection, through new forms of employment, through retraining and reskilling. And um, we also think that workers would be part of a just transition planning to make sure that no one is left behind in the process of transitions. We're also advocating for the creation of climate-friendly and um, uh, decent jobs to make sure that um, uh, the, the transition will also um, contribute to mitigation and adaptation efforts. And, and during this entire process, from the beginning up to the end, the rights of the workers must be um, preserved and upheld. And it's so true. Before every United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of Parties, it would seem that a typhoon would be hitting Philippines and that the voice, really the conscience, of the cops would be the people from the Philippines who had just experienced everything, reminding everyone of what's at stake, how it's really life and death. And I'll never forget Haiyan and, and others, but then most recently, even here in Hawaii and Lahaina, when we see what happened with the wildfires, it really does point out what all that you're sharing, that we really have to focus first on a decolonization. We have to focus on a decorporatization and then a decarbonization and also even a decentralization that we make sure that the people have more power in their basic aspects of life and really an energy equity is at the core of that as well. Yes, that's true. And I think um, because you said that, it's also important to raise of historical responsibility um, when it comes to who really is um, responsible for the climate change. It's not the informal worker in Pakistan. It's not the home-based worker in Nepal. It's not um, the street vendors or the jeepney drivers in the Philippines. It's the huge corporations that have been... Um, uh, uncontrollably um, producing and emitting greenhouse gas emissions. But at the end of the day, it's the marginalized and the vulnerable, especially the workers who are being impacted firsthand and directly um, by these impacts of the climate change. And, and they are the ones who are also not protected at the end of the day, um, they, they experience disasters, but they don't have any sort of um, protection that are immediately and readily available for them um, during these types of disasters. Yeah, and as you highlighted, there really is that importance of when we look at the future of employment, 
you could look at some potential paths for how we can guarantee a rights-based approach. But what's really exciting is, is what you're sharing, that the new green jobs already exist, that a just transition not only is the right thing morally, but also really the triple bottom line. It's people, planets, profits, and we can all live healthier. We can all have a higher quality of life if we think of it in that holistic manner, beginning with and centered around the right to work and unionize. Yes, exactly. We cannot address one problem only. Um, in, in the in the discourse in transition, and and again, uh, the, the the concept of trust transition has been widely popular now thanks to the campaign of the trade union movement. However, however, um, such concept of trust transition has also been sort of greenwashed. Um, you know, um, there are, um institutions that use the concept of just transition without the main element or principle of justice present. They think that a green transition is necessarily a just transition, but that's not the case. When workers' rights are not protected, when workers are not part of the just transition planning and don't have a voice or meaningful participation in this process, that is not just at all. Because they have to be included and left behind from the first step up to the last step of this transition. It's so true because everyone, without any discrimination, exercises the right to equal pay for equal work while also protecting our planet. It's not an either or, it's really an end both. Can you share some priorities for upcoming COPs and next steps as we look at the important aspects of climate justice? Um, in the upcoming COP, we are still um looking at strengthening the Just Transition Work Program, particularly um, the win that we had, which is the recognition of labor rights um, in this work program. Um, it is the first time that a UNFCCC document is referencing labor rights and um, labor rights, and we think that is very important. We'll continue to fight for the inclusion of social protection um, in uh, in, in, in many documents in, in the UNFCCC, um, particularly in the area of adaptation. Um, we also support the call for the creation of climate-friendly and green jobs, especially decent jobs, not just any types of jobs, um, um, in the process of the just transition. It's so crucial as we look at this. Article 23 is really the beginning in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it does guarantee the right to work on a clean planet and secure an existence worthy of human dignity, on a livable world committed to climate justice. But it also points out what you were sharing about of how international labor organization has also developed and made sure that we have a holistic perspective of well-being for all around our world. Thank you so much for joining us. And we appreciate you sharing the important work that you do as an advocacy officer and the work that you do to make sure that labor rights are guaranteed and a form of liberation for all humanity going forward. And thank you so much for allowing me to highlight the different issues of workers, um, especially in this crucial times. Mahalo. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.